we are here with Aparna Shankar who is head of equity PMS yes. with SBI yes. and uh, the PMS actually you know has shown great resilience especially during tough times and uh, I think you know the reason is the framework that uh, SBI PMS is following which is ESG framework so it is a very very peculiar framework I really liked that and that is the reason I wanted to first cover you know what that ESG framework is okay so thanks for coming Kamal and taking us on board uh, ESG framework I mean the, it's an acronym for environment social and governance so ESG framework is a top up of the grid what we do when we look at the stocks how do you look at the stocks what how do you identify a stock is what uh, is important when you have it in the portfolio so we look at all the factors like we look at the, uh, the the three pillars what we first look at is that whether the management is capable second is whether the business is scalable and third is whether the profitability is sustainable so after when we see these uh, three first three pillars then we go for the next level of the uh, filtration is that whether the ROE has been a sustainable over a long period of time for us ROE for this uh, strategy particularly for uh, ROE is not a static ROE we don't say that the company should have been you know posting of a 3% kind of plus kind of an ROE but what we look at is that the ROE has to be better than the cost of equity. It has to be better than the cost of equity at least by 3 to 4 percent. Why I say so is that cost of equity is a moving part. I mean there have been times where the cost of equity has been in the range of 7 percent, 8 percent and there have been times where the cost of equity has been in the range of 12 to 14 percent. So if it is a 12 to 14 percent cost of equity, ROE of 15 percent is not sufficient for that business to be very good. So that's what why we say ROE is a static. It's a plus something of cost of equity. That plus is around three to four percent. Then we look at ROCs also, and that's what is captured in the scalable business businesses. And then the uh, capital management is very important because we feel that you know management is the most important factor of any business, whether it is a bad business, good business. The you know, management has to be always a good qualitatively. And then they can turn, you know, kind of media for businesses also in a very good business. That's what's the plan. And then the sustainability, sustainable profitability. Why sustainable profitability? Because it has gone through a different cycles of the economy. It has still sustained that kind of a profitability or maybe improving profitability is what reflects uh, the quality of the business. So if you are done with this, you are identified a good business. In addition to that, we look at the ESG factors. Why we look at the ESG factors is that, uh, see all other factors, ROE, ROC, is that everybody is looking at it. We have, you know, kind of a little forward looking approach to our investments. What we feel is that, is the company, if the company is good for the society, the company is good for the portfolio also. So if the company is aligned to how it treats its waste, how if it doesn't throw, I mean it treats its affluent and doesn't throw in the open air or open water, then it is a good company. You have already taken steps to avoid uh, kind of unexpected regulatory changes, penalties, levies, something like that and you have anticipated that as a management and you have taken care of that. So you will not you will not be hit by something sudden maybe in 2-3 years time whenever the government comes out with a better regulatory framework that is one purpose we have seen so many companies in uh, near past also I mean I don't want to quote a name but it's a large conglomerate and they had to shut down their plan because there was a uh, you know public uproar about the affluent uh, not treating the affluent and throwing, throwing it into the water so we don't want to be into that situation, we feel that if the management is aligned to those kind of concerns, it's a good business to own. Social again, how you treat your community, how you treat your employees, whether there is a diversity in your uh, uh, people you employ, that is very important to look at. Whether the board is diversified, whether the auditors have been you know, regularly uh, you know, changing the appointing a different auditor after the five years term and all that, that is also important. 
some of the companies we have seen there is uh, that auditor is audited only those companies so it is better to avoid that those kind of companies because we don't know what will be in the you know kind of a cupboard what is lying there in the cup in which what skeletons are lying in the cupboard so we try to avoid that these are the factors which these factors esg factors allow us to uh, convert those qualitative factors into quantitative quantitative factors so that is very helpful sure. when you have a score in front of you you have more conviction in the idea okay these are the companies which will not face any turbulent times in next uh, few years where you are holding the stock with in your portfolio so it's an additional factor which is kind of a forward looking factor that's the esg philosophy so basically in this sbi growth with values portfolio we invest in companies which follow positive standards of esg that's the right that's very important oh, right so one very interesting aspect about your pms you know which i practically experienced is that you had taken an exit call one year ago from tata motors so you entered at 350 you exited around to 32 40 so you know what did you gauge at that point of time so actually uh, exiting a, st- a stock where you have made a loss is a kind of a very courageous decision yeah, yeah i mean you always feel that okay this stock or this price will correct and there will be some change in the business but that was that block i never had in my mind ever we always see what is the incremental change in the business and tata motor was a classic case for this we kept on evaluating evaluating it at different prices i mean the first blow had come at around 400 rupees and it fell down to 350 rupees to 330 rupees and then we were contemplating whether what is to be done with this stock we made the management we got you know kind of positively convinced but then the the way the management was explaining the things were not you know uh, uh, emerging in the same way the management was expecting the leverage was going very high and then the, then the ev was the biggest thing which hit them hard and uh, when you talk about tata motors it's uh, we have to always remember it's just a 10% of indian company it's 90% is resides outside the india and then the whole 90% of the piece was not getting uh, the due, due uh, kind of you know uh, the growth what it was anticipating the leverage was going and that was the decision we said okay nothing doing this stock i mean this company this business we must exist and that whatever that quite prices we did not keep thinking uh, whether it has fallen so much where how should we exit and all that we just said that the business does not hold Uh, the strength where it should be in our portfolio, so we exit it. Uh, that and that's the philosophy we follow for you know, all the exits. I mean, there are few more examples right. there in the portfolio where we exit it and where we felt that you know going forward the business incremental change and the profitability is going to get right. impacted continue and we'll make money in some other stock. Right. We identify a better yeah. stock. So in fact, your call went very well because you know Tata Motors from two hundred and forty is falling to one. Hundred and ten. So you have actually protected. Yeah, I mean, I was happy to. Side. But you know, at the same side, uh, there are uh, three stocks. So one is Alu Valia Contract. Second is Dixon Technologies, right? Yes. So and yeah, so I would like to yeah. yeah. So which you which had actually fallen. Yeah. And then uh, you had held on to them. Mm-hmm. And then you know they have rec- they, they, they recovered. Mm-hmm. Right. Third being HDFC Asset Management. Correct. Correct. So. So when I talk about uh, first, I will talk about HDFC asset management. I mean, w- if you look at our portfolio, it is tilted towards the leaders of the industry. You know, the, we identify uh, kind of stock, uh, different uh, sub segments of industries, and then you try to identify who is the leader and who is the challenger. If the challenger is, you know, kind of uh, uh, its growth and profitability is going to hurt the leader, then we. uh you kind of try to invest in the challengers where the valuation and then the uh, opportunity to make money is much more otherwise it's a leader a leader takes it all i mean leader is what derives the profitability of the indus that sub segment so hcfc amc was one of the leader i mean there was an other the option was to invest into reliance amc which we uh, kind of avoided now when you look backwards then you feel that it was a good decision but that that is what we we had evaluated it as reliance in amc also but then you know hdfc amc was standing so out it was kind of outstanding we had seen what 
they have done with the network in with HDFC Bank and even HDFC, uh, the main HDFC. So we were sure and we had met the management, we had met the management pre-IPO and understood their strategy, business strategy, how they are going to you know, uh, expand their network. Though we are in a similar business, so their strategies we, at that point failed at, uh, much better. And that's why I decided. And uh, we, at the IPO time, the, you know, it, there was so much of hype and we bought at that point of time. It failed down, but we still continued to hold uh, large weight in HFC MC because our conviction was uh, very strong and we were seeing the business grow. Uh, right. We were so positive about it. That was one thing, I mean, it was a kind of outlier type of a situation for HDMC MC. Alubale contracts, if I <coughs> if I can say so, this was one of those early companies where construction companies having low leverage was not heard of. I mean, construction companies. I myself used to strike construction as a sector, and three times leverage in a construction company was a normal in the last uh, cycle. This was the uh, initial companies where they had you know. Uh, like a huge emphasis on going uh, bringing down the leverage and they were almost you know 0 0.02 times the leverage and that was what was a outstanding feature for this company so we held on with that stock we had bought it low it went up we still invested invested we knew that and plus this was not in exactly a road construction they were all into you know, uh, other you know building <laughs> universities and everything which is a kind of a secular business. That's why we, uh, when we are not uh, investing in pure construction companies, we were still invested in Alwalia construction. That was the third, uh, second stock we talked about and you talked about Dixon. Dixon also, also again we had a high conviction. We uh, you know respect the management so well. Their focus on ROEs and ROCs is very, very uh, commendable. And now they have, uh, mobile was the missing piece, now they have mobile uh, outsourcing, I mean, the making uh, parts for the mobile is also in their bag with Xiaomi coming with them. So, I think that was also on the right track. So, there was uh, only, uh, I mean, the fall in the price was not because of internal to the company, it was what was happening outside their business environment. It was, you know, mutual funds have, were shifting their portfolios from mid and small to large and the whole definition by SAB was changed and everything was turbulent outside the business. Sure. So I think those were the uh, candidates we had to, we held on with the, and in the portfolio. And how is your portfolio poised, you know, as of now, <coughs> given that markets, you know, have seen broader correction over the last 18 months. So what is the, uh, you know, uh, mix in terms of small, mid, large sector allocation and are you doing any changes? in the near future? Changes, we keep evaluating uh, potential candidates always. It's not one day job. I mean, we look at new business, keep looking at new businesses, identifying new businesses. If there is a place for that kind of potential candidate to come into the portfolio, that's what we keep evaluating. Currently, we are at around 50-52% large cap and balances into mid and small cap. Uh, going forward, I think we will be in this range of 45 to 55 percent of large cap and balance in the mid and small cap. Currently, we are at around close to 10 percent in cash. We are, you know, uh, analyzing few uh, companies where we would like to invest, but we are just uh, mm, looking at the numbers, how the market is spanning. And one thing, what we do as a fund house, as a current this portfolio strategy, also we almost work towards zero market timing strategy. We don't take, you know, kind of active cash calls. The cash which is lying in the portfolio is uh, is into the intermittent phase of from exiting one stock to investing another stock. I mean, we don't create cash because market is looking bad. Or, I think it's our job to identify uh, businesses, good businesses at all points of time and we been we have a large research team. The strength of SBI is lies there also. We are all fit on street, though we are from by side. I mean, most of our analysts are always outside uh, meeting companies, doing channel checks. That's a huge strength what brings, uh, what helps to identify. Stop. I myself have been an analyst for many years. Right. And now I am managing the fund. Right. 
Right. And what is your view? You know, uh, do you see an opportunity to get into NBFC space in terms of you know the correction, coming down of valuations, or are you still you know waiting and watching? Okay, so NBFC was another. I would what was a happy decision. I should share that we have been away from NBFC for almost one one and a half year. Uh, why we were away is that um, uh, we felt. I mean, one one and a half years back, we felt that the uh, interest rates are trending up, and the investors will find it difficult to you know borrow uh, borrow at a lower cost, and that will impact their margins. And then there is a no differentiation between a, a mainstream bank and an NBFC. Why would anybody will go to an NBFC when the you know, uh, same borrowing is available at a bank? That was the this uh, that was a thought which made us exit all our NBFCs. And there's something different happened actually in the uh, banking sector, and NBFC got impacted so hugely. I mean, that was not we had not anticipated that, but we were just lucky. But our thought process was right, and we were out of that. And now, last month, we are again started evaluating the NBFCs. First, we started with an NBFC which may not face a huge problem in borrowing, uh, you know, large sums to support their growth. So we have looked at Mahindra and Mahindra Financial Services, sure. which is a part of part of our portfolio now. And maybe we will add one more. Uh, if 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 the you know valuation is attractive, we may add one more NBFC. But it's not compulsory. There are so many good ideas waiting now for to come to the, into the portfolio. So we have to just uh, right. identify which stock to buy. And about the sectors, I mean, <coughs> though we are aligned to the sectoral weights in the indices, this is a all bottom up strategy. So we are not kind of uh, uh, we don't go as a okay. We have to have presence in a sector. We don't do that. Uh, if it's an outcome, I mean, sectoral weights of a portfolio is an outcome of the bottom up stock picking. All right. <coughs> so you know, in few words, if you have to explain, you know, what differentiates. SBI growth and value PMS from maybe its peers in the industry. So, in few words, if you have to explain that, what would you say? So, I feel that SBI uh, growth with value portfolio is more forward-looking portfolio. We are anticipating things which may change in future, maybe in next two three years, and we are investing in those managements who have also anticipated those kind of changes like ESG. Factors uh, filtration is more is very important uh, strategy for our portfolios, and we have seen the results of that. We could avoid so many stocks uh, which had a kind of a turbulent, uh, you know, corporate governance governance related fact uh, issues. So we have avoided almost all of them. We have touch wood. We have you know kind of un unscathed. So so many fund houses could have faced those kind of problems. That is one thing. I think so that's, that's very important. Yeah, that's that's actually the most important aspect. And markets have actually taught <coughs> this lesson time and again. Yeah. That you know, uh, numbers even if they do not deliver for some time can still be tolerated by markets. But any quality related issue, any corporate governance related issue, market is not at all ready to tolerate. Mm -hmm. So your core philosophy is you know revolving around environment, social responsibility, right? And yes. uh, yeah. What is the third factor? E. E stands for environment. A stands for social social and G stands for governance. Right. So people talk about corporate right. governance. Right. We are actually yeah. implementing. We are, you know, uh, that's what I mean. It's just in the head when you talk just quality. We are is the management acha is the management acha nahi. We actually drill it down and put it in the quantitative terms so that you know we do not have any uh, ambiguity about. How this management uh, stands up against another uh, stacks up against another management. Right, right, right. Thank you so much. It has been very You are always welcome. Thank you.